Um, so yeah, this uh, talk is called Designing for Empathy, and my name is uh, Jens, and I'm a uh, lead programmer at Might and Light. So first, some introductions of me and the company. Uh, so first of all, this is my um, spirit animal. I went to game uh, 2011 to 2014, and I uh, did the game design and programming um, line. Uh, so my last year, I uh, applied for all of the internships. Uh, I did get an internship at Might and Light as a gameplay coder. Um, and fairly soon into that, uh, I was hired, and then I was lead for Shelter 2. Um, and lead is also the same as Forever Alone in this case, uh, as it can be in like small indie game studios. Uh, so it was like a, a very chaotic project, and uh, it was up to me to solve that. Um, but since then, I've done a bunch of projects, and they seem to want to keep me. I seem to find myself to want to keep being there. Um, so I did an alumni talk 2014, when I'd been there for like six months. Uh, and it was me and Peter Strohle who talked about Shelter 2. Um, and that was an interesting talk in hindsight, because it was like right in the Shelter 2 production where, where we started to uh, figure out some stuff and, um, and understand what worked and why. Uh, and I'll get back a bit to Shelter 2 in, in this presentation for some of the points. Uh, yeah, so I've been around six years at uh, Might and Light in February. Um, I've shipped some games, uh, some other titles, uh, things like interactive books and the likes. Uh, I've been like supportive uh, on a few others and like done two weeks of coding or similar on those projects. Uh, I've also taken care of our online baby meadow uh, for two years, uh, but now I have left that because we recently split up into two teams. Uh, so I'm lead programmer for the um, uh, Book of Travels team, and uh, the other lead coder, she's um, uh, responsible for Shelter 3 and meadow. Uh, so the question is, why is a lead programming a programmer having a talk about emotions and game design? Um, and that's because besides uh, the programming and lead work that I do, uh, I mean, the next biggest thing is uh, game design, and specifically, like, system design is what I'm good at. Uh, and I'm also doing, like, other small stuff. Um, I would like to have Sebastian's uh, image of a lot of hats here, because I think it applies. Like, in small studios, you usually wear uh, a lot of hats. Um, so introducing Might and Delight, for those who, who are not aware of us. Uh, we're an artist-heavy indie game studio who does like weird emotional projects for the most part. Uh, I usually introduce us with that we're known for the Shelter series. Uh, it's a ma mainly a series of um, motherhood adventure games. So most people have seen like at least the art uh, at some place. And hopefully now we're also known for um, my project baby Book of Travels, uh, since we've like, been pushing that a lot. And just for some statistics, uh, we're 23 people uh, right now, which is like the most uh, we've been ever. We've been like down to six people at times when I worked there. Uh, so we split up into two teams. Uh, we're four programmers. So like the main um, workforce is artists. Uh, some other statistics, we're 60, 40 men, women. We're 13% game alumni and we're 13% Sophia. Uh, that's a common name for some reason. Uh, so as a studio, we have some like clear internal goals. Uh, we had a rebus in our old office that read out, we'd rather fail with something that we love than succeed with something, something that we don't like. Uh, and I do realize that, of course, this applies to a lot of people and places, but we do take some like, business-wise stupid decisions because we, um, we want to steer uh, a project in a certain way or we don't want to do a project that speaks to us when another one would be uh, more economically motivated. Uh, and then we'll see how long that lasts. So our titles are uh, often exploring things like motherhood, loss, freedom, and solitude. Uh, so there's always this, uh, this questioning emotional layer in our titles. 
we use mixed inspiration sources and we as people and uh, both professionally and personally we have different backgrounds and I think that is our strength to do these uh, sort of weird titles. Um, and every project has their own identity. We don't uh, only do motherhood adventure games. Um, and I will, uh, through this talk, deep dive a bit into the projects that I've been closest to. So going on, just to like some, um, some general concepts before I uh, go into the uh, concrete projects. So the sort of emotions that I will be talking about is uh, some of those that I mentioned, I, um, some emotions that aren't that much represented in games, um, or not associated with commercial games in, uh, in that regard. So Mario Kart um, maybe doesn't evoke the feelings that we try to evoke, uh, and my own analysis would be that Mario Kart evokes frustration or joy, depending on your skill level. I'm personally terrible at games, so it's more of the frustration part. Uh, and I love Mario Kart, and that's fantastic, but that is not like in the, in the domain that I will be talking about. Um, and as I've been like searching my personal references, I haven't found any like specific mechanic like this is an emotion-inducing mechanic. Like it's jumping emotional, nah, it could be. Uh, so I more see it as an ingredient in crea uh, creating an emotional response for the player. So you take mechanics and you contextualize them and you add reward systems to them. Uh, and then you can get uh, a game with an uh, emotional, mo emotional goal. Um, and I think it's Ernest who has um, an article on how narrative and mechanics work together. That is sort of an inverse relationship that uh, for example, if you have a, a really complex trading system, you might not care so much about the narrative. Uh, so if you want a more narrative game, you have to have like ease up on the mechanics so you don't have to focus uh, on the gameplay systems as much. And uh, just personally, I think that gameplay that does invoke emotion also has to stay on the simpler side of things. Uh, and then there's a question if the uh, mechanics need to be reward-driven or not. Or not. Uh, I like to call them meaningless mechanics, that it's an action that you do uh, regardless, like you don't get points for it, uh, you don't um, get anything that drives you towards an end goal for it. Um, and for example, in most games where you can jump, you often jump even tho though you don't have to because like the animation looks funny or something like that. Uh, and I put Marie Kondo here, um, first as a joke, but I think that uh, if it sparks joy can be a really like good measurement of um, mechanics that fill out the interaction and just like these are pleasurable things to do. Uh, for example, um, in one of our projects, you can uh, jump on puffball mushrooms. And many people have like encountered this as kids in the forest and you stomp on them and uh, as a little cloud of smoke comes out, and j that's just like an enjoyable thing to do. Uh, so a bit about the people who play these games. Um, so understanding our demographic is a bit of work in progress, and uh, we absolutely don't have like an age, gender sort of definition of this, uh, but we'd rather try to read people's res responses um, talk to people who have played our games uh, during playtests, trying to see what it is that keeps people playing. And uh, for example, we know that uh, a lot of our player players are explorers. So we usually um, put in exploration gameplay or uh, uh, some sort of collection that is not the main point, but we know that these people will appreciate it. And I think that some people here has gotten the same um, like Facebook ads for mobile games that I have um, uh, that I've seen, which is like, just slide here, so easy to play, so easy to get into, play now, yeah. Um, and I think that the Might and Delights games is sort of the opposite to that, that we're much more toned down and there is a requirement to engage to get something out of this. Uh, so it's more like, 
here is a game. And of course, we thought about like feedback loops that you're not explicitly told what to do. You're not always explicitly handheld held or uh, you don't get feedback that you did right. You get feedback that you did something. Um, but yeah, it's a bit like harder to uh, get into. Uh, so we're filling a niche and we know it. And um, uh, it's a, a bit like every project that we try to see like, okay, for these previous titles, would a person who likes this like this game as well? And if we try to broaden that, how can we make this more accessible to more types of people? Uh, and we work quite a bit with accessibility as well. Um, uh, like we had during Shelter 2, we had a thing that uh, we brought in our parents to playtest, uh, and parents who are absolutely not uh, gamers. So just seeing like a person interact with a game um, who doesn't play games at all is um, it's interesting to just see like which cues are working. And if they can play the games, gamers will be able to uh, snap up the mechanics as well. So our internal measure of success would be, um, I mean, besides the business standpoint, that we've successfully invoked the emotions that we want to, uh, to players. Uh, so to know if we have succeeded with a game, uh, we like read a lot of um, reviews and Steam threads and uh, just try to keep understanding uh, why players are drawn to a specific game. Uh, so this review, for example, is for Meadow, and we've gotten a lot of feedback of uh, people tr finding it very relaxing and calming, and like people with anxiety play it to to tone down their emotions. Um, and we've been like working with that as well, which I will get to uh, later in the talk. And for Shelter Two, which is um, uh, more emotional, there's a lot of um, Review saying like I cried and I called my mom, and that is when I feel like really proud as a game designer to like I made you feel this. Uh, and then we have my absolute favorite review of Shelter One. <laughs> We're turbo in the garbage and we know it. So uh, yeah, of course this is for Shelter One. We should have had leaderboards of how many kids you managed to save. Yeah. The, this just, this sparks joy for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so about who, uh, who can do emotional games. And um, I wanted to uh, like um, vocalize that we're not the only kids on the block. There are other commercial studios who do uh, very emotion-inducing games successfully. Uh, so this is like um, one specific angle of uh, this sort of games. Uh, I've also seen like a lot of interesting bite-sized projects from game jams and similar. Uh, that, and there's especially one that uses a lot of the same principles that I will be going through. Uh, so there's a game called The End of Us. Uh, you can play it in Flash uh, as long as Flash lives. Um, and I think this was used as an example when I studied here for like, this is how you, you can create a uh, connection between like um, a player and an entity. So the base concept is that you are one of these uh, me uh, meteorites flying through space, you get joined by another meteorite, and you have a sort of like playful behavior that if I move a bit to the left, they will come after me and with sort of wrestle. Um, and then in the end, uh, one of these meteorites will crash into uh, like a big planet and only one of them survives and keeps going. So it's like two minutes to play through. Um, I would recommend to do that and just like to get a feel of uh, what they did in such a small scope. So I wrote in the pitch that I would talk about um, like the process from uh, concept to end product. And um, uh, it's about this slide that I'm talking about it. So um, uh, we start out with like a base GDD and aesthetics goals and like the player should feel secure here, they should feel sad here, uh, they should feel this at the end. 
uh, and then what like systems and mechanics we have to achieve that. Uh, personally, I use the MDA framework to sort of contextualize my iterations. Um, Design-wise, I'm mostly working with a person who doesn't come from a game school, so we have a bit of different vocabulary, but we usually get over that, and like, when I contextualize it in, the player should feel this, I think this part of the system is hindering that. Uh, we can talk sort of the same language. Uh, and otherwise, for iteration, um, we play test, and I go like, we want this part to feel this way. What is the worst part? What is hindering me from feeling calm at this moment? Like, is it the music? Is there bugs? Is there something wrong with the systems? Should the part be scrapped? Should we just like redesign the system because like this is clearly not working? And just like whittling that idea baby down to something that actually works interaction-wise. Um, and I will ha have like s some specific examples from projects, uh, but as I was writing this slide, I felt very basic. Uh, like this is how you make games 101. Uh, but I think it's also a testament to uh, that we're not really doing anything magical and that it's um, like our goals and concepts that, uh, that create these types of games. So there was a... Um, um, an article in Kotaku for uh, like a few months ago uh, where there were devs from uh, Mortal Kombat and similar games that uh, deal with very graphic violence and just like how that wears people down mentally uh, to like be really into these animation of dismemberment and like uh, people burning out and having nightmares about this. Um, so we don't do dismemberment, but we do deal with like heavy emotional subjects. So I have like one anecdote uh, at the end of Shelter 2 when uh, one guy in the team just felt that he couldn't play this anymore because um, you're supposed to lose cubs through gameplay and he just emotionally couldn't bear it because he was thinking about his own children. Um, and that was fine for him to like take a pause from playtesting, he could do his like other work duties. But it's still like a lot of people having to test like, uh, this part is very sad, but can we make it more sad? Is the animation triggering correct? Is this audio cue uh, triggering correct? And just like exposing yourself for that uh, time and time again. Um, and the uh, ending of pause, which is a side project uh, was a bit difficult for me, because partly it was stressful and the ending, um, just like the workload of that, and partly uh, the point of the ending is that uh, you've been raised by your Lynx family, uh, you uh, get separated from them, you be you're alone for a while, and then you meet the bear cub, and you form a friendship bond, and uh, you go through obstacles together, and then you find your Lynx family again, but will you choose to go with them or with the bear cub? Um, and my uh, design <coughs> intentions be uh, behind that was very much of like biological family versus chosen family. Um, yeah, and we like, didn't really discuss that, um, but it was just like going through this sequence again and again and debugging was uh, difficult. Uh, and then we did a very silly online project called Meadow, uh, and that was very therapeutic to develop because we didn't uh, design anything for loss anymore, but it was just like silly and social and like all of these um, positive emotions uh, that we could delve into instead. Yeah, and there is the article. Uh, so as a summary, like these sort of games are niche, but they definitely have an audience with money. Uh, and the design principles are really nothing new. Um, it's base game design principles, and then we're just steering them towards a specific direction. Uh, so the process isn't any different, uh, but the goals and the perspective is what differs it. And for better or worse, uh, when you develop these sort of games, you will face what you model repeatedly. 
so going on to empathy for AI. So we have an AI and we want to make the player care about the AI. So first of all, it's to figure out what should the player feel for the AI. Should they feel responsible? Should they feel dependent? Should they feel like this is a codependency and this is a friendship and we help each other? And I think the worst case scenario of this, when you should feel um, responsible for the AI, is that it feels like um, like a, a quest in World of Warcraft where you lead someone somewhere. Um, and that is like the worst sort of uh, quest line in those sort of RPGs because uh, the AI is walking faster than you walk and slower than you run. Uh, you just want to get your sword of doom and you have all of these other motivations than helping them and they are just like being a, a real bother. And so that's been like one of the biggest fears of like, oh, what if it feels like an escort quest? That would be the worst. Uh, and then to make the player care, we build up their feelings towards the AI with interactions. So you're exposed to the AI and you do things with them and uh, the goal is that a bond will form. Uh, and then we use this bond to trigger, uh, trigger other emotions. Be because if you don't care about the AI, we can do nothing. But if you do, um, we can work with that. Uh, so for the Shelter 2 example of getting the player to care, uh, you play as a mother lynx, you have four adorable cubs, and your goal is not to kill them. So uh, with this problematic in mind, uh, we made sure that the AI characters are the point, and there's like no other reward systems than keeping your cubs alive that is uh, important. So we have a, like a really strong focus of like everything you can do, you can do for your kids. Uh, so the base system of this is hunger, that uh, the cubs have an invisible hunger meter. Um, they express it in a few different ways, but uh, their food meter goes down and you can bump it up by catching food and feeding it to them. And um, one thing we did here uh, was to make the player choose how to feed. Uh, so you have four cubs, but if you bring them a bunny, only two uh, of them will be fed by the bunny. Uh, and there is some feedback like uh, if they've recently eaten, they scale up, they have a bit of blood in their face, but that fades away quite quickly. So you'll have to remember like, did I feed the gray one the last time or should I feed it again? Uh, and that becomes like an uncertainty so you'll be stressed to uh, keep hunting prey to feed them. Uh, and there's also feedback um, other than this, uh, but it's easy to forget or miss. Like um, they stop their playful behavior if they're hungry, they, uh, their calls become more whiny, um, the, the hue of their fur mats out a bit, uh, but I think like very few players actually like, noticed these things. one big thing that we changed here from the base concept was we originally wanted the uh, the player to be able to die but uh, then that became the main focus and not the AI so we uh, cut that a bit so the stamina is a risk reward investment of if you eat you get more stamina so you can run further and therefore hunt better um, and I think that worked out well in the end so you still feel like, but if I eat this bunny and not my kids, I could hunt, the, hunt that deer. But if I fail with that, they will be hungry and I don't know what to do then. Uh, we also thought about like the pacing of how we uh, go out with these events. Uh, so we're starting off slow, like the first uh, time should be stressful because you're learning the game and not because uh, your cubs are dying. So they start out fully fed uh, they start out in spring, which is like the easiest time to find food. Uh, so you just like can have a bit of bonding time with your family before you uh, keep going. Uh, and an important thing was to have empty space between important moments, because this is, this is an open world game and we can't really steer like, oh, in level two, this will happen. Um, so there are like time-based events 
uh, that we can uh, paste differently. So for example, when you do lose a cub, the other cubs get a little bump in their food meter. So if you've been really shit at hunting, you don't lose all your cubs at once, but you get to like feel that sorrow of losing them properly before there is any like threat of, um, of more cubs uh, going to perish. Uh, we also have some dangers uh, that we have limitations on. So partly like pausing them in the beginning, uh, there's also different dangers in different levels and for different ages of the cubs. Um, there are some numbers that if you have faced this danger uh, like one or two times, it will not trigger again in your playthrough. Just to like um, keep the novelty and the fear of this danger so you don't get used to it. So regarding the AI design of the cubs, uh, it's a lot about food because that's the main game loop of the, uh, of the experience. And so the AI we started to create uh, didn't work very well because it was an AI that was fun to do as a developer. Uh, and it was like very chaotic, like uh, are they in the mood for eating? Do they want to explore? Do they want to run around and play around? Uh, and then what the player did wasn't really affirmed by them, and the player didn't feel needed. Uh, so we redesigned this to uh, go more with what is the player expected to do, and how do we like affirm that you're doing something correct, you've hunted for your kids, good on you. Uh, so we had a clear priority of this, that if there's a danger event, the cubs will keep close and act worried, because that should be a stressful moment and you should just focus on this uh, danger event that is going on. Uh, if the player is hunting, uh, they will imitate and crouch down, for example. Uh, and if there is food, they eat. Uh, so there comes the hobbit part. Uh, and an important part of this was that if um, there is any food held by the player, they should go for that to make the player feel needed. And otherwise, if the player is moving, they will follow. Uh, and that makes sure that they're uh, often in camera, which helps with bonding. Uh, and first, at like this priority level, we go with the AI behavior that was there in, in the beginning, so they can like be playful and run around. And like if the player is just sitting still, uh, they will idle around in a cute way. So when we created this um, attachment to the cubs, then we can see where we want to evoke emotions. So uh, the main thing that we do here is that we threat what you care about. You love your cubs, you want to keep them, uh, but then we have these danger events where you can lose them. And even if you don't lose the cubs, uh, there is still the fear of, oh my god, I could have lost them. Uh, and that's what that is about. Uh, the cubs also evolve a bit in their behavior, so when they're small, they just imitate you when you hunt, and where the when they're older, uh, they will hunt with you. Um, so you're supposed to like feel pr uh, proud for them that you have taught them this. Uh, and then they will leave you at the point. So you should feel conflicted about that I'm proud because they've progressed, but they no longer need me, and what should I feel about that? Um, so a bit more of sadness there. Um, and going on to uh, the project Pause, which is this project that was um, a side project for Shelter 2, where you play through like a similar scenario, but you are one of the cubs instead of the mother. So it looks like this. Uh, and we reuse like some environments, we reuse some models and like scenarios to um, like have these sort of events, but from a different perspective. Uh, so it was a, a challenge to like uh, model this other side of family life because it's no longer the player who has the um, the agency anymore. Uh, we have some similarities with Shelter 2 in introductions that you get exposed to the family, you interact with them fairly stress-free and just like get introduced to the world and the mechanics. Um, and we do a lot of like hand-holding for the player that the mother is doing something and you're supposed to follow and do the same. Uh, and to start caring about the siblings, it's more of like 
playful, worry-free interactions. And like sometimes the mother will just lie down and you run around and wrestle with them. Um, so yeah, then you get lost from the family and you meet this little cutie. Uh, so the first part about caring about the bear cub is that you have found yourself to be uh, alone and vulnerable and then you found find this bear in the same situation. Uh, and firstly, you have to hunt food uh, to help this bear. So you get to feel useful and using your accumulated skills to help the bear. Um, and that is like the first bonding moment. And then as you continue through the game, uh, the part you play with the bear is a lot of like puzzle solving together. Um, that like hopefully reads as quite endearing, uh, and that's like how you get exposed to the uh, bear cub part. Uh, yeah, so through the puzzles you have different strength vulnerabilities, um, and I wrote vices because uh, the bear AI will run around and um, like if there's food nearby it will often prioritize that, so uh, it's a bit of a chunk. Um, but hopefully an endearing chunk. Uh, so the AI design with the Lynxes was that uh, the mother should be very focused on like teaching and take care of you. Uh, and like partly scripted sequences where it's like, now you learn to crouch, now you learn to jump. Um, but also like some more dynamic things. Uh, and one thing was that we looked for a solution for um, what if the player just runs away from the family and doesn't engage? What should we do then? It's weird if the AI doesn't follow that. Uh, so if you run away too, uh, too far, the mother will run after you, pick you up, walk you back, uh, and then like continue with the sequence. So if you're just abusing this, you have uh, like uh, lost sight of uh, like the point of the game. But hopefully, like players have done this unintentionally, and then like, oh yeah, I don't have a lot to say because mom is carrying me back. Uh, and otherwise, like the the siblings has have these playful interactions, and they try to include you, uh, so they will like run up to you and wrestle you down, or uh, like yell at you and try to get you to like hunt butterflies with them. Uh, so unlike Shelter 2, this AI takes a bit of the lead of the player and sort of drags them along and like, now we're doing this. Uh, so the bear uh, is a bit more of a companionship that gives and takes. It's a bit between like the uh, having a child and having a parent uh, sort of dynamic. Uh, it's more moody and playful than other AIs we've done. Um, so it's goes on to its own things at times, uh, and sometimes it's part of the puzzles. Uh, so for example, one thing is that you're going over a big open field and the bear is scared. So you have to stay close to the bear and like uh, call out to it that it's okay um, to like get it to go over with you. Uh, but for gameplay's sake, it will prioritize at specific points and like, yeah, you wanna jump up that ledge, I'm just gonna stand here then and let you do that. So for evoking emotions, like the main points was um, we give you the security of the Lynx family and uh, getting separated sets a tone and a goal like, oh my god, I'm alone now and my goal is to find my Lynx family again. Uh, and there we introduce a scent mechanic as well, so you can always uh, scent your surroundings and you will see uh, the footsteps of your Lynx family so you can trace them. Uh, it also triggers some like ghost images which are uh, pre-animated sequences of, like the first one is that you see uh, where you lost your family and how they walk up a hill. Uh, you see them like uh, snuggle up to go to sleep and things like that to like remind you like, oh, this is my goal, this is my goal. I want to get back to the family. Uh, we also uh, had in mind to have like similar interactions with the lynxes and the bear uh, to make them both feel family-like. So. Uh, the same way you communicate with the lynxes, like you call and they answer, that is how you communicate with the bear uh, to get it to go places. Uh, there's like 
uh, ending of levels, you go into trigger box, and then you will go uh, um, to a specific point and like cuddle up to sleep, and you do that like both the Linksys and the Bear Cub. Uh, so hopefully um, the player feels some conflict about like the bonds for both sides, and when they realize that they have to choose one side to progress in the narrative. Uh, so as a summary, uh, with like building empathy for AI, you define what the relationship should be to the AI, what feelings you want to evoke uh, for the AI, and if you want the player to care about them, you have to make them the point and not an inconvenience in your search for the uh, long sword of doom. And uh, I think most importantly, like making a time and space to get uh, the player to care. And then uh, you can see how you want to use this attachment to evoke emotions. So going on to empathy for other players, since we've done online projects. Uh, so we did a, um, uh, a shelter project that was online, which is called Meadow. So the general concept is like an online social pr playground, uh, which should be a more lighthearted than, for example, Shelter 2 and Paws. Uh, and going from AI-driven to people-driven games was interesting because I felt that I had a quite good grip on like how to cheat with AI, how to do like specific behaviors to make the player feel a certain way. And suddenly we had no AI and we would try to uh, form people to behave in a certain way. Uh, so this started off as a technical collaboration because um, uh, a guy had apparently emailed us uh, every year for like five years and said, I want to do something online with you. Uh, so hi, Mark. Um, and he had like an, he was like the perfect person to uh, to do this collaboration with because he's a network programmer, but he wants to do like weird uh, social things with the uh, projects he does. So the emotional goals with was that this should be a relaxing social experience. Uh, I like to call it a forum in games clothing because the socializing should be the main point but you still do game-like uh, actions and interactions. Uh, and it's like a third-person um, game view with like pretty normal controls. Uh, yeah, and just have like less negative emotions than earlier shelter titles. We didn't want to deal with loss in this one. Uh, so just like a very uh, light-hearted version. Because we had... Uh, have had a few players who are like, oh, I love the concept of the shelter games, but this is too emotionally heavy for me. And yeah, this was a bit of a, like a project for them. So uh, we tried to like um, do a sketch of what we needed to do to uh, create a space where uh, social harmony would be. So the game could not be stressful or intense. It could not be competitive. You shouldn't be able to play it wrong as a newcomer and like inconvenience um, more experienced players. It should be accessible at different pacings, so you don't have to like act quick on anything. Uh, there should be openings to help each other uh, to create these social connections. Uh, and there should, al should also be uh, this empty space, so you don't uh, have to engage like constantly, but to have these calm moments in between so you appreciate like, oh, I haven't seen anyone for 10 minutes now and there is someone, I want to like go say hi to them. Uh, and yeah, there was a, um, an interesting um, thesis on this my year, which is called Preventing Toxic Behavior Through Game Mechanics, which also like looks a bit at, uh, at principles like this and discuss them. Uh, Emma Matson was one of them at least. So in Meadow, you communicate through emotes, which looks like this. Uh, so the background to that was that we wanted to have like a, an online environment that was as little toxic as possible. Uh, so we created this emote system to like create the vocabulary for players. And like this is what you can say: there is no text chat. Uh, some people use Discord uh, to it as well, but that's their choice. 
uh, and we looked at uh, Tokipona, which is uh, um, a language by a, a linguist called Sonia Elenkisa, which is, uh, I think it's like a hundred words, uh, an experiment in like how simplistic can a language be and you can still express yourself with it. Uh, and it also has words that are positively charged. Um, so we try to like incorporate that as well. So you can do an angry emote, but it's like a cheeky, cutesy, angry emote. Uh, and otherwise, we looked at like what uh, should the player want or need to express. Uh, so we did like a few testings of this and like added and removed things. Um, and it's like one of the things that we update a lot, like especially these more grammatical symbols. Uh, we just noticed that oh, people want to be able to say this, um, and that seems reasonable. So um, that's a thankful uh, piece of content to add. Uh, so we have the emotes. You can say that you're happy, cheeky, sad, uh, annoyed, amazed. Uh, and then we have what we call commands, which, which are the grammatical symbols. Like the bear cub here says that they want to go into the cave. Uh, the badger is not sure where they are. Uh, the lynx is just derpy. <laughs> so yeah, in, in there's a lot of like endearing situations that have uh, arisen with the, this uh, emote system. Uh, and then we have like some fringe categories. You can do actions which are like uh, emotion-based things, like you can do a little dance or you can wave or things like that. Uh, and some specials, so you can do like a 3D emote of a fire, uh, which is a bit. It adds to like the silly vibe. Uh, of the game. Uh, so for example, just like uh, with combining emotes, uh, you could say, like, oh, I'm so tired of waiting for this. Uh, or you could say something like, I want to show you this really cool thing or just follow me and it's so great. Um, and we didn't have like the combinations from the beginning, but that was a very like uh, appreciated addition. So you could uh, specifically pair symbols of like, this is a combination of what I want to say. Uh, so going on to a bit of more like the gameplay loop of Meadow. Uh, so I usually say that there's two main system. There's uh, collecting and socializing and expression. Uh, so you collect a lot of um, things in the world like uh, flowers, some puzzle pieces that unlock uh, emotes, skins and new animals. Uh, you also uh, collect things like um, flowers and crystals and mushrooms. And uh, this collection feeds uh, the socializing expression that you get more material uh, to express yourself with. Um, and then it feeds back that if you socialize, you will uh, collect uh, more efficiently. Both that, like if you travel in a pack, someone will notify you like, oh, I found a puzzle piece over here. Uh, but there's also a, a collaborative feature, which is uh, these, we call them obelisks. So here we can see that we need uh, a frog, a lynx, and two uh, whatever animals to be here and shout at the rock, and then the rock will give them loot, which is these puzzle pieces to unlock more content. Um, so a lot of like socializing is uh, collaborating and searching for these uh, to collect together. And then we have the exploration, because um, if you want to collect things, there aren't a lot like uh, at the center of the world. Uh, so you have to like venture out uh, and look for like uh, the more cooler and rare stuff. Uh, and also for socializing, if you want to show someone uh, a cool place up on a mountain, um, you will have to go there because we put like more effort into uh, creating special uh, and unique places that are like far from uh, from the center hub uh, of the game world. Um, so otherwise, a bit of fringe stuff in the gameplay. Uh, we have like some toys uh, in the game. We have like the same uh, jumping on puffball mushrooms that we had in pause. Uh, we also took up that some of these um, mushrooms work as footballs. So it's just like when you're exploring with your gang, uh, you can encounter these silly little things to do 
uh, in the meantime. Uh, and we also have like an, um, a dimension of that. Uh, if someone wants to play this indefinitely, there's like a, a mechanic motivation because everything you collect gives essence. Uh, the essence goes up on the leaderboard. And if you're like top 100, uh, you get access to the eagle character. Uh, so there's, al um, there's always like a motivation to like, oh, I can collect more and I will get something out of that. Uh, so in a way, um, we fulfilled Mr. Turbo in the garbages. Uh, actually, all of the things he thought was bad with Shelter One, we did in Meadow. So we have trading cards, leaderboards. I hope he's uh, seen the project and loves it. Um, so I just want to bring up like some mechanical considerations that isn't like full systems, but it's like small tweaks we did that had uh, a large impact. Uh, and first of all, it's the movement speed that all of the animal characters have slightly different movement speeds. So you can't like fully run away from someone, but it's um, uh, it's become a very empathic thing uh, that um, like if you're a faster animal like a deer, you wait up for the smaller, slower animals. Um, so that uh, creates like an interesting uh, social dynamic in that. Uh, and something we didn't have in mind at first was that when I pick up a flower and you're by me, you will also be able to pick up that flower. Uh, and this just like came to me mid-development because I was playing a lot of Pokemon Go. And like, if I can steal the flower from you, that will be a very bad interaction and you will avoid other people. Um, so I think that is like the, the most impactful design decision that we did. Uh, and one important thing is that you can't uh, directly affect other players, so you can't push them over a ledge, you can't pick them up, uh, you can only like emote at them and scream at them, um, but even then they can block you uh, if they think you're an asshole. So um, we try to like accommodate different uh, player needs with that. Uh, yeah, and I've been updating this for two years, so there's been uh, a lot of design decision on how to maintain this social harmony that we uh, that we achieved with the base game. So th people have both both been like happy and angry about different things. Um, one case that uh, I think is interesting that was that someone was um, uh, complaining that everyone is so loud and they're like screaming all the time and there's a specific goat voice that is my absolute favorite that sounds like it's dying. But they were like, oh, this is too much for my ears, but I still want to hear the game. Uh, so we did a, like a limiting system that if you spam the call button, your voice will uh, stop sounding. And like the day after, people were like, no, the cacophony was the greatest thing. Why did you remove this? Um, so we just like made that an option. So uh, different people can uh, like tend to their different needs. Uh, and a similar thing that uh, was that I did a feature that is mud tag. So we have these mud pools uh, around the levels. And if you jump in them, you become dirty. If I run into another player, they will also become dirty. Uh, and if you uh, jump into the water, uh, you will get audio feedback on like how many people you've tagged, and the mud will also disappear. Um, so I thought this was great and fun. Uh, and some people did too, but it wasn't like universally loved and people were like, oh, I don't want to be dirty and uh, I just want to be able to like tap out of this. Uh, so partly you can like in the options tap out, like I don't want to be a part of mud tag uh, and also like a quick button to like, oh, I just want to get this off me. Um, and we didn't think that we needed a block system in the beginning, um, but people will go to great lengths to be assholes and just like following specific players around and uh, yeah. Um, so we did build a block system uh, after a while that you can see like, oh, this goat that is nearby me, I just, nothing from their account, please and thank you. Um, and then there was one case where people were complaining about like different things like uh, meadow feels so um, calming, but these things feel stressful. So I just like did a collection uh, thread and like uh, the August update will just be like a quality of life things 
what do you want, what do you find stressful, uh, and we'll fix that. Uh, so that was pretty well received, and just like admitting that we don't know how people play this all the time. Uh, and there is uh, one specific group of people who are pushing very hard for that matter should be PvP and survival. Uh, <laughs> thank you for laughing at that. It's just like we have this re really weird base concept and they want to kill each other and it's just besides my mind. Uh, so we, d we filter a lot of feedback of like, does this actually uh, resonate with like the core game, uh, gameplay idea? Um, and just like try to see like would this actually make the game better? Uh, so we had a bit of fun with this. Uh, we have a stray cat that goes into the office, and uh, uh, she did this cute thing that she batted after uh, a wolf that our audio designer was uh, doing sounds for. Uh, so we posted this on Twitter just to like make fun of the uh, PvP survival people. Uh, so in summary, um, if you're designing for empathy for other players, you can look at the mechanics and reward systems, like are they inviting empathy, or are you competing for something with uh, other players? Is it easy to grief other players? Um, and how can like players tap out if like I don't want to do this, uh, can I choose not to? Uh, also how players should communicate. Um, not having text chat seems to uh, work fairly well. Um, it's not like just us who done like an emote system, uh, but the Endless Forest did something similar, and like Journey did something similar with uh, gestures. Um, so that's like the common denominator of like positive uh, online communication, as far as uh, I've found. And uh, yeah, taking a look at like how players can impact each other, like. Can someone push me, and will that disturb my uh, my gameplay experience? Um, and I think this goes for all games, but uh, with Meadow, I think we we most had a use for listening to and analyzing what player needs and wants, and how they read different situations. Because uh, we, as the dev team, don't play it in a lot, lot of ways that our players actually play this. Yeah, so I'm um, about to close up this talk, but I thought I'd talk a bit about like the sort of uh, design questions that we're dealing with now in Book of Travels. Um, so we're doing like an emote communication system here as well. Uh, and it's a lot of about like the view and visibility of the communication. Like, can you scroll with the camera? What about then if I can see you, but you don't respond to my emotes because you have a mo more zoomed in camera? Um, how do we communicate like if you're in the menu or thing things like that? So that the social harmony uh, is easier maintained. Um, yeah. Another design issue I have is how to make tea parties convenient. Uh, because as a skill, you can brew tea. Uh, the tea will have different effects, like this is a healing sort of tea. If I brew tea, uh, can I refuse you to have it? Uh, does it take like more, um, more resources for me to make tea for eight than tea for one? Uh, and what we landed on there is like, I can make a tea of healing. Uh, and like anyone who's nearby can sit down and have a cup of this tea and get the same effect. Uh, it doesn't take more of my resources. And through that, um, we at least hope that this will bring like more social harmony and like invite people to uh, interact more with each other and like share things uh, with each other. Uh, yeah, how to play the loot without being an asshole. Uh, we've also been working a bit on like a collaborative music uh, system which is, um, it's a lot about where to, uh, where to limit the music. Like if I start to play a melody, will you also be able to start to play a melody? No, that's stupid. Um, but you can join into my melody. So I play the lute and you play like a drum segment of that. Uh, and suddenly we have an activity together. And otherwise, 
uh, we're probably going to limit it like in these situations you can't start uh, to play music. Um, yeah, and just like summarizing a bit. Um, if you want to create empathy, you have to get the player to care about whatever it is. Uh, and then you can use these emotions to uh, evoke emotions in the player. For example, threatening to uh, take away something they are attached to. Uh, and it's a lot about like the palette of the actions and the context that you give the player. Like, are you able to do this? And um, a communication about like the world and its uh, rules through what the player is presented with. Uh, and trolls will find a way, uh, even in cute, weird online experiments. Um, but most players will uh, act according to the tools, and if you don't give them the tools to be an asshole, they won't. Um, and there is no magical emotional development. It's more about what your perspective is and what you focus on. And suddenly, cat. Uh, but yeah, that was all for me. Thank you. <laughs> I will now take questions if you have any. Uh, yeah, who has the mic? There's, yeah. <laughs> so if you shout really loud. Okay, let's try. Middle guy. Yeah. How did you measure what emotions you evoked in the playtesters? Yeah, so the question is like when developing shelter, how do we measure the emotions uh, felt by the playtesters? Um, so part of it uh, was watching playtests. Part of it, part of it, um, part of it was to interview people afterwards uh, and try to ask like very non-leading questions. So like, when this happened, how did you feel? Um, but you could also see a lot of like, just like watching their face and their screen while playing. Like, oh, now you're frustrated because you're stuck or like, now you're sad because this happened. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think the furthest up was someone. <laughs> yeah, so the question is how we go about funding our projects. Um, I'm the worst person to ask that, but uh, I mean, don't quote me on this, but we have uh, like a, a base funding. Um, and uh, otherwise, we mostly like um, make do selling games. Uh, right now, we're doing like two uh, big projects that aren't covered f uh, by like meadow sales. Uh, so then we get like um, the base funding to help us like get through this development period until we can release Shelter 3 and uh, Book of Travels. Hmm. Yeah? Um, you mentioned um, uh, asking um, players about their needs and wants. And yes. Uh, I was curious, is it challenging to figure out with these kind of games, uh, sort of, um, are, are players able to articulate? Do you find it hard to separate what they want from what they need, if you, if you understand mm. what I mean? Yes, absolutely. So the question is, uh, like, is it hard to filter um, what player wants and needs based on their feedback? Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's quite different because, like, um, for the like, user-friendliness stuff in Meadow, it was quite easy, like, uh, these sound things are disturbing me and I just want options to take them away. Uh, but most of the time, it's, like, um, it's a bit of detective work to see, like, you're playing it like this, this is what we get uh, up in the interview. Like, I think that this is a problem, but this is what you're articulating. And just like trying to dig out that is, uh, yeah, a big part of like the iteration process. That works. 
Hello. Hello. Uh, for this, uh, if this uh, indie company of 20 plus a few people, mm -hmm. what tools are you guys using? Do you have your own engine or are you using any already made ones? Uh, yeah, so the question is what tools are we using? Uh, we're yes. using Unity for everything. Uh, we have a bunch of like in-house made uh, tools for Unity, but yeah, that's about it. Any other questions? Yeah, then we're done. Thank you. <laughs>